Good morning and welcome to the uh, first of two videos on the second section of chapter three. All right. Now, chapter three, of course, is all about how we perceive the world around us, sensation and perception. And it deals with the nervous system and uh, all of our uh, our senses. Um, this second section is entitled How We See and How We Hear. Um, and arguably, these are the two most important senses that we have for gathering information about the world around us. All right. So again, this is the uh, first video on the second section of chapter three. One, two, three. All right. So our obviously and arguably our two most dominant senses are vision and hearing. OK, um, other animals rely more on senses of smell and senses of taste. Um, uh, some even rely heavily on senses of touch. Um, and these are important senses as well. <clears throat> but vision and hearing for human beings are probably the uh, most important senses uh, overall. Remember uh, also that the sense of touch is actually one that is uh, composed of multiple senses, right? You can uh, sense with your fingers whether something is hot or cold, rough or smooth, and so on. Now, um, interestingly enough, um, the visual and auditory sen uh, senses, in other words, seeing and hearing, are different from uh, taste and smell and from the sense of touch. Right? The sense of touch relies on um, nerve endings in your skin. All right, um, and, and a variety of other things. The sense of smell and the sense of taste both rely, rely on chemical signals that are coming into the body from outside, right? Your food uh, has chemicals, is made of chemicals, right? So you sense those with your taste buds. Um, when you smell something sweet or something foul, um, those are chemicals coming into your nose. But uh, your vision and your hearing rely solely on physical energy. All right. Now, if you, any of you took uh, uh, physics last year or, or sometime during your high school career or even a, uh, a uh, physical science course, course, maybe in middle school, you probably know at least a little bit about uh, the idea that physical energies come in waves. All right. Uh, what that means is that they move through the air, through the wall, through whatever medium they can move through, um, but they don't actually uh, move that medium. Now, what is a wave, you ask? Well, waves have three primary characteristics that we're going to describe in, uh, well, now. All right. The first is wavelength. All right. And the wavelength is the distance in one cycle of a wave. And don't worry, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a picture of uh, a couple of waves and ask and show you what these things actually mean. But it is uh, the wavelength is essentially the distance from one crest to the next crest. All right. At least in light. Sound moves a little bit differently. Sound is actually a longitudinal wave for those of you who paid attention in physics. Um, but, but light is a transverse wave. It goes up and down like a sine curve or a cosine curve, if that rings a bell. All right, let me go back. Uh, the amplitude is the amount of energy in a wave. Um, and the amount of energy determines its intensity. All right, if, if a wave has more intensity, then it's brighter light or louder sound. Okay, and it's defined as the height of the crust of a wave. And then finally, we have the frequency, which is the number of times that a wave cycles through in one second. All right. Uh, and this is especially important in hearing. All right. Um, it turns out that wavelength and frequency are inverses of one another mathematically. And so one over the wavelength gives you the frequency and one over the frequency gives you the wavelength. But the wavelength of light waves is important for our vision. And the, um, the frequency of sound waves is important for our hearing. Okay, so that brings us to this diagram, all right? And um, you can see, oh, come on. 
uh, one wavelength is the distance between here and here, between the crest of one wave and the crest of another. All right. Now, I don't want you to be confused because I don't. Uh, it, that's not the only place you. That's not the only place you can measure the wavelength of a wave. You can start here and go to here. This is also one. My I have a ghost in my mouse today. Apparently. Um, you can measure it from here to here. That's one wavelength. Or from here to here. That's one wavelength. Now, um, the wavelength is abbreviated as a lambda. All right, that's the Greek letter lambda. And that is equal to one over the frequency. And the reason for this is that the speed of a wave in a given medium is a constant. All right. And so uh, wavelength is a, is a measure of distance. Frequency is uh, the inverse of time. So distance over time is velocity. All right. We're getting into the weeds here, but I just want you to understand that the wavelength and the frequency are inverses of one another. <laughs> OK, so um, what are the characteristics of light waves and sound waves, respectively? All right. I probably should have put a picture of a rainbow or something in here so that you could see what we've got. But for light, um, you know the colors of the rainbow, right? <coughs> Excuse me, red, orange, yellow, um, uh, green, blue, and violet. All right. There's no such thing as indigo, by the way. There's, there's no I in there. Some some English teacher wanted there to be a vowel in Roy G. Biv. Um, but red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and violet. So um, blue light uh, and violet light tends to have a very short wavelength and a very high frequency. Okay. And, and remember, they're inverses. So you would expect that if one is short, the other is high. Um, and uh, the wavelength of blue light is around 400 nanometers. Now, nanometers are 1 times 10 to the negative ninth meter. So we're talking a really small distance here. Um, on the other hand, uh, a, a light wave with a long wavelength, now long is a relative term, but long wavelength and low frequency um, is red light. And uh, that has a wavelength of around 700 nanometers. All right. So, I mean, again, we're talking about a really small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum here between 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, but uh, relatively speaking, blue has a short wavelength and red has a long wavelength. Now, in terms of the amplitude, all right, remember that amplitude is simply a measure of the energy that a wave actually has. If we go back to our deal here, notice the amplitude measurement is this. How high is it from the uh, average point to, whoops, to the top of the wave or conversely to the bottom of the wave? This is the amplitude A. Okay. Um, and so the bigger the amplitude, the brighter the light, okay, the brighter the colors, okay, and the lower the amplitude, the uh, lower the light, the dimmer the light, okay, and, and the duller the col colors will appear. Now sound, on the other hand, um, again, we're dealing with um, short wavelengths and high frequencies and long wavelengths and low frequencies. Um, a high frequency wavelength of sound gives you a very high pitched uh, noise. <clears throat> um, so, if Elmo comes to visit you, that's a high pitch. That means that the frequency of the sound is very high. Okay. Um, on the other hand, <coughs> on the other hand, um, if there is a low frequency sound, um, that is, uh, that will give you our low frequency sound wave that will give you a low pitch. Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. Right? So, um, it is, uh, a low pitched noise and a low frequency. Um, 
And again, the energy values, if there's a lot of energy in the, uh, in the sound wave, it's going to be a very loud sound, or at least we're going to perceive it as a loud sound. If, on the other hand, it's a small amplitude, then the sound will be relatively soft. Okay, right? A whisper. Okay. All right. Um, now, interestingly enough, there is no direct mechanism for your brain to translate light and sound, all right? You, your brain cannot process physical energies like set light waves or sound waves. And so what must happen is that the, these stimuli, the light or the sound, has to be converted into a neural signal before you can perceive light or sound. And of course, what does this for human beings are our eyes and our ears, respectively. All right. So the, the eyes convert the physical energy of light into uh, neural signals that can be translated by our brain. And the ears uh, translate the physical energy of sound um, into neural signals that can then be translated uh, by our brains. Okay. Or at least interpreted by our brains. All right, and that uh, that process, by the way, is called transduction. All right, the changing of light waves into a neural signal and the changing of sound waves into a neural signal is referred to as transduction. Okay, now uh, this is a diagram of our eyeball, and it'll pop up in just a second. Here we go. All right. And so the anatomy of the eye is kind of interesting. There are three basic layers and they're they're listed here. Uh, the sclera is the outside or the white of the eye. And by the way, a little piece of trivia for your next cocktail party. Um, there's the only human or, sorry, the only animals that actually show the whites of their eyes under normal circumstances are human beings. All right. Look at your dog's eyes. Look at your cat's eyes. Look at your hamster's eyes. All right. You can't see any whites there. Now, the white of the eye is transparent in the front right over here. All right. And this is referred to as the cornea. So the cornea of your eye is actually part of the sclera, but it's transparent, so obviously, so that light can pass through. The middle layer is called the choroid. And the choroid is represented here by this pink stuff and the, the pink layer. And the little red and blue dots represent the blood vessels, the arteries, and the veins. They're not really red and blue, but we draw them as red and blue so we can tell the difference. But this is a muscular layer. And um, you can see that it surrounds the entire eyeball. But up front, the, there is a special circular shaped muscle um, called the iris. And this is the part of your eye that is colored. So if you have blue eyes or green eyes or brown eyes or, or even black eyes, not a black eye, you know what I mean. Um, that's the color of uh, your, your choroid up front. Uh, and the choroid itself has a hole in the middle and the hole is called a pupil. And that again, lets the light from the cornea through uh, to the lens. In addition, the choroid also has these little uh, ligaments that uh, actually uh, are attached to this thing here, which is called the lens. And what those ligaments do is they stretch the lens so that you can focus on things that are either close up or far away. More on that in a minute. The innermost layer of the eyeball is called the retina, and that's the uh, little white and tannish area that you see in here. And this is where the action is in terms of sensation, all right? The light uh, that comes from the outside is, comes in and is focused um, to the back of the eyeball. And so if you're looking at a person who's sitting out here, all right, what happens is that the light is actually uh, translated and it comes in and light from up here goes, uh, what just happened? Light from up here goes here, and you end up with a projection of the person like that, all right? The projection is actually upside down, interestingly enough, but we'll get to that in a minute. 
Just a few other anatomical notes. These right here are your eyelashes, so the muscles in your skin, and this is the bones of your skull with a little layer of fat in between the, the bones of the skull and the eyeball. Okay, uh, so let's uh, now, now that we know a little bit about the anatomy of the eye, let's talk about things that can go wrong with the anatomy of the eye. All right. Um, or, under ordinary circumstances, you um, uh, focus light from objects of different distances directly onto your retina uh, in the way that I illustrated in the previous slide. However, some, uh, some people have issues with their uh, ability to focus images. Um, and the two most common ones are farsightedness and nearsightedness. Now, farsightedness is a, um, uh, a visual problem in, uh, in which the um, light from nearby objects comes into focus behind the retina. Um, and what that essentially, uh, the reason for it is that your eyeball is anatomically, physically too short. All right. And so the, the light waves are focused behind where they need to be focused. Nearsightedness is just the opposite, all right? Well, for farsightedness, you can see things that are far away, but you can't read, all right? Uh, you know, things, a book or uh, uh, a piece of paper um, held, you know, a reasonable distance from you is difficult to see. Now, people who are nearsighted can't see things that are far away. And this is a visual problem in which the light waves from distant objects come into focus in front of the retina. And in this case, we have just the opposite scenario. Now the eyeball is too long, okay? So if you are either farsighted or nearsighted, we can fix that for you, all right? Um, opticians and, and um, ophthalmologists and, and those sorts of folks uh, design lenses that you can place over your eyes so that the light waves are focused and then refocused by your, your biological lenses and that, so that they reach the right place at the back of your eyeball on the retina. So, um, oh, one, another uh, picture here, all right? So this will illustrate the idea of both farsightedness and nearsightedness. Um, but uh, it'll also throw in an astigmatism. Astigmatisms are the third of the three major um, issues that occur with our eyes. Um, let's concentrate first on nearsightedness, all right? Uh, in a nearsighted person, notice that the, um, the light waves that are coming in are focusing at a point here. However, they need to focus here, all right? So the eyeball is literally too long in this case. And so the rays are focusing on a position in front of the retina. And so what we do to fix this is, oh, for God's sakes, we place a concave lens in front of your eyes. And what that does is it causes the light. It's 8 o'clock. Thank you, Jesus. It causes the light rays right here to diverge, all right? See how they're spreading out? And then when they reach your actual biological lens, that causes them to, to converge right on the retina, which is a beautiful thing. In a farsighted person, on the other hand, um, by the time we, the, the eyeball is too short, and so the light rays that are coming in from objects that are uh, close by, um, in this case, notice when they reach the retina, they're still spread out. They're not focused. They're only focusing on a point way behind the eyeball, whereas they should be focused right there. Um, so what happens here is that we place a convex lens in front of your eyes. And what that does is as the light rays come in, as the light rays come in, uh, it causes them to converge. And then your biological lens causes the, them to converge even further, and we end up with uh, the, the light rays focusing right on the retina, 
which is what we want. Now, just a, a brief mention of astigmatism. And astigmatism is an issue with the cornea or possibly the lens. Um, and what uh, an optician or an ophthalmologist will do is they'll design a lens that is that matches the cornea of your eyeball. If you can, if you look at this picture, you can see there's like a little bump here on this cornea. And so we match that bump with a lens right here, and that will allow the light rays to focus properly on the back of the eyeball. Okay, so uh, let's talk then um, just briefly um, about the, uh, the retina. The retina is the light sensitive layer of the eyeball. This is where the nerve endings are. All right. This is where light is actually um, sensed. All right. Uh, it, the retina itself is, is composed of three layers. Uh, they are called the ganglion, the bipolar cells, and the photoreceptors. All right. And there are two kinds of photoreceptors, the rods and the cones. Now, um, the ganglion and the bipolar cells are the outer and middle layers. The, the um, uh, Photoreceptors are actually inside, they're the, the deepest layer. And so light actually has to pass through the ganglion and the bipolar cells, um, then eventually reach the receptors, the rods and the cones, and they're absorbed by special proteins called photopigments, all right? Um, and then uh, those photopigments, because they're proteins, they change shape and that causes the um, neural signal to be generated, all right? And so the receptors send impulses back through the bipolar cells and the ganglion, and eventually to the optic nerve, which then runs through uh, the skull to the back, to the occipital lobe of your brain, okay? So the ganglion, the bipolar cells, and the photoreceptors. Now, of those three layers, of course, the most important, well, they're all important, but um, the ones that we're going to talk about in terms of sensation are the photoreceptors. These are the rods and the cones. Now, the rods are receptor cells in the retina that are responsible for allowing you to see in uh, low light conditions and black and white. Okay. Um, if you've ever been outside as the sun has begun to set, you'll notice that all of the color seems to drain out of the world and eventually everything becomes shades of gray, right? Black and white images, if you will. And so um, the rods are what allows us to see uh, even in darkened conditions. Right? As the sun comes back up, the color comes back into the world. And the colors that we perceive are, are the purview of the cones. Receptor cells um, in the retina, again, that are responsible for bright light and for color vision, okay? Um, there's also a, uh, a tiny area in the center of the retina that is completely filled with cones. Um, and uh, this is, so most of the bright light and color that we see is, is uh, sensed by this area, this fovea here. Um, just as a, uh, a little piece of trivia, you've got about 120 million rods and they're, they, they're all around the retina. Uh, you only have about 6 million cones um, and they're found mostly in the center, in the fovea, okay? All right, so uh, that, my friends, ends the first of two videos on how we see and hear, right? And I hope you learned something.